lecture number 8, April 12, 1958. Now, the best way to introduce you to a very complex subject of style is to tell you a brief story which some of you have heard from me before uh, in our preliminary session. But it will illustrate the whole subject for you. When I was writing Atlas Shrugged, I spent quite a long time preparing in my mind a scene, which you might remember, where Francisco comes to Dagny in the country. You know, when he st she stands at the door of, of her cabin and he comes to her and, and their first kiss after years. Uh, it was a very complex scene, as you remember, and a great many things had to be integrated and organized. And I remember being literally exhausted days of walking down the road in front of my house in California and planning this. And one day I told Frank that I was very tired planning this scene. And he knew, of course, the content of the scene. And he told me, not too seriously, uh, that all of that's simple. All you have to say is, he rushes up the hill, he seizes her in his arms, he kisses her, and she likes it. Now, that is the best illustration of one rule. The fact that everything between that sentence and what you finally read in Atlas Shrug comes under the department of style. That which you can synopsize in a brief sentence, uh, that is content. Style, strictly speaking, is the how. The how is done. Because, in effect, everything that takes place in the scene is exactly what I said. But the difference between that sentence uh, and <coughs> the final execution does depend on the style of the writer. In a very broad sense, theme, plot, and characterization, the three elements we discussed up to now, belong to the what of other novel or a play. But everything that is the how comes under style. At this point, I want you to be clear on one epistemological issue, namely that in all relationship of a what and a how or means and ends, that which is a more immediate end becomes the means to the ultimate end. You know that relationship in general existence. For instance, if you're reading a book in preparation for an exam, the exam is your end and the reading the book is the means. But you pass the exam in order to graduate. Uh, in that sense, graduation uh, is the end and the, uh, passing the examination becomes the means. But you graduate in order to, to uh, practice a certain profession. So from that aspect, the graduation becomes the means, and the profession becomes the end, and so forth. So that in relation to writing, you can say that every step is an end, and a means to the further end. The wider element of, of any book, of course, is the theme. And you can say that the plot is the means to express the theme. Characterization and plot are extremely interwoven. You can regard them uh, interchangeably. Either the story is the, uh, the end and characters the means, or the characters the end and the story the means, uh, because you can't separate one from the other. That is, you can't create proper characterization except through the actions and events. And you can't uh, present the proper story without proper characters. So that, that is interchangeable in the sense of them uh, interacting. They're both mutual means and ends, characterization and story. But now these three elements, theme, plot, and characterization, can be synopsized. They can be shortened, and the essence can be presented in a synopsis, just in the way that I illustrated in the story. But style is that which cannot be synopsized. Uh, you know, very often you have heard and probably have said yourself that some play or some story is not much, but it's the way it's done. When that demarcus is warranted legitimately, 
that is an issue of where the plot or message might be slight, but uh, the style unusual or very good. Now, uh, in relation to style itself, I don't know of any official definition that the travel is a, in all literary courses and in aesthetics generally there are no firm definitions of anything. It's practically non-A realm on principle. It's supposed to be the realm of mystics and therefore I don't know any firm or official definition, <coughs> only approximations. But although people vaguely agree on what is plot or what is theme and characterization, I don't know of anyone that ever said anything sensible as, as on style, at least not to my knowledge. I must admit that I'm not a very wide reader of literary aesthetics. Uh, however, everything that I'll say about style here is my own definition. Uh, I divide the issue of style primarily into two broad categories. One is the content uh, of what you select to include in order to project a certain issue. The other is the way in which you use words. What I mean by selection of content, well, for instance, take again the example of the Dagny Francisco scene. What you really had to present is exactly that synopsis sentence of Frank's. But now what kind of elements will you decide to include in order to describe how he rushes up the hill? or how he sees her in his arms, or what she feels. By what means are you going uh, to convey that? Are you going to describe the scenery? Are you going to show dialogue? Are you going to describe their feelings or thoughts? What you select to include in order to present a certain scene is what I call selection of content. Now, the words by which you will project it is self-evident, uh, what that category is. It's the ultimate and the actual work of putting down on paper what you have decided to say. And in the order and selection of words, you will see, as we study examples, the most, the widest and most startling variations. There are many ways of doing it, as there are many. Uh, more than your fingerprints, the question of style can never be duplicated. Uh, that is, no matter how many people share the same philosophy, no one is going to be imitative of another person's style by necessity. I mean, there are bad writers who just copy, uh, but in the issue of creating an authentic style, there are so many possibilities in language and in all the complex issues involved in the book that you never have to worry about uh, not achieving an individual style. You'll achieve it, but you'll achieve it to the degree to which you do not aim at it consciously. I had mentioned this before, and in any other context, by, but mine, it might sound like mysticism, but I think by now you know what I mean by that. I simply mean that the issue here is so complex, and uh, the early students here have heard me do that one night, you remember, during the question period, which the others of you have not heard because it wasn't recorded when we analyzed just one paragraph out of the rest was shrugged, and we discussed why words had been selected that way, what would have happened if we had changed them, etc. And from that example, you could see that there was no possible way to write that paragraph that way uh, by conscious superstructure, uh, fancy driving selection. I had to write by means of the kind of premises about philosophy, literature, and everything involved that had already become automatic to me. And so when I write it, this is the way I wrote it. I could later account to you and to myself why I wrote it that way. But I could not have composed it uh, to begin with, with no premises set, and simply by superstructure calculation of how do I want to present a certain kind of issue or paragraph. I said in our preliminary stations, if you remember, that st uh, in regard to style, form follows function. Uh, in other words, what determines your style is your purpose. 
both in the whole book and in each particular paragraph or sentence. But when you consider how many issues have to go into even the simplest story, you will realize that there's no way to figure out the function and the form consciously. For what you really have to do is set your literary premises, work on those, and that write unselfconsciously. Write as it comes to you on such premises as you have. You can criticize and age it late, later. But do not attempt self-consciously to set out to have a brass style, a dramatic style, a sensitive style, or any other definitions like that, because to begin with, they're false. No such lines can be drawn. And above all, never try to imitate anyone else's style. You've probably heard that there are such schools of writing, or series of writing, which ask young students I've heard of it even university assignments, to write stories in the style of certain writers. They'll give you an assignment of write one like Sinclair Lewis and another one like Thomas Mann, etc., another one like a stream of consciousness. Well, there could be nothing deadlier than that. You might turn out into good hacks if you practice it, but that would be one sure way of never acquiring a style of your own. Because the style is actually the combination of all your purposes and premises, and not only of your literary ones, because your literary premises, as you have, we have observed time and again, will come from your philosophical premises. You cannot borrow another man's soul, and you cannot borrow his style. All you can do is an, uh, be a cheap imitator, and an imitator is never as good as the original. Uh, the only way to develop a style is to write as purposefully and as clearly as you can on your own premises. And your style will develop with practice. Uh, after everything that I've told you about plot uh, characterization and the, the way in which even these issues cannot be settled fully by conscious calculation but have to be, uh, have to depend on the premises you have already stored in your subconscious, the premises that have become automatic, uh, you will remember the explanations. I don't have to explain that to you again. But in style, about that issue applies above every, uh, above, above everything else. Style is so much more complex than either plot or characterization that here, more than anywhere else, you will just have to learn to trust your subconscious and if it doesn't work for you, then you'll have to do more thinking and uh, learn more premises to make them automatic. That is, if you feel after some years of work that your way of expression is not really right or that it doesn't express what you want. It will only then be a matter of doing some more thinking or identifying about what you do or do not like in literature and why. But never try <coughs> to force it by any artificial means. A forced style is one of the most uh, obvious things. If you know psychologically that <coughs> premises will out, it's nowhere as true as it is in writing. When someone is writing in a phony, artificial manner, it's as apparent as, as a neon sign. So it's much better to write slightly more awkwardly, but naturally, than in a stilted, artificial way where one can see the writer literally sitting 10 minutes over every word and, and then looking at some example, copying it and very carefully piecing a sentence uh, adjective by adjective. Don't try that. <coughs> now, uh, we will be taking uh, separately, the issues of the selection of content and of the use of words. But, as you will see from the samples we'll be examining today, they're so closely interrelated that they can be identified only, or uh, separated only for purposes of identification, so that you'll know which is which, but you'll see to what extent they're interdependent. Now, another division, or in effect cross-division, because all the departments of the issue of style uh, 
crossfire in a certain sense. Another division is the issue of narrative versus dialogue. Well, those terms don't have to be uh, defined. I mean, this is fairly obvious. Narrative is everything which is not dialogue and vice versa. And dialogue is that which is, represents the actual words of the characters in the story, that which is put in quotation marks. Now, I use narrative in two senses. Now, this is one sense. The other is the sense which we had mentioned before, and which is narrative versus dramatization. From uh, the standpoint of form, narrative, as I said, is everything which is not dialogue. But now, uh, from the standpoint of the structure of the story, I call narrative those passages which are not dramatized in the sense of being described as taking place before the reader's eyes. Uh, a scene which is described as if in the present tense, not that you ever use the present tense, uh, but that it's described as if taking place before the reader. That is a dramatized scene. Any scenes or events which are merely described as having taken place, usually the connect connecting passages, the uh, passages covering years and periods of time between key point dramatic scene, those uh, passages I call narrative. And I think that's generally accepted. But uh, you, you see then the slightly different meaning or sentence in which I use the word narrative. In a dramatized scene, whenever you say he said, or uh, he said in a trembling voice, etc., or any paragraph interrupting the dialogue, all that is narrative. Everything which is not said by the characters is said by the author, and therefore everything said by the author is narrative. But in the other, in the structural sense, narrative is any scene or event which is not dramatized before you. Dramatization is that which takes place right in front of you. And incidentally, just as an aside, uh, the, the usually, whenever you use dialogue, uh, that pertains to a dramatized scene, but as you know, there are exceptions. For instance, you can use narrative and introduce in it the quotation of just one sentence said in some conversation which you report in a synopsized form. That is a perfectly legitimate method, and it's usually done to feature uh, the essence of the conversation or to show more sharply some salient stress point uh, where you quote just one, perhaps sometimes two, uh, lines of narrative, of a dialogue in a narrative. But that, uh, when you do that, that does not make the narrative passage a dramatization. That is merely using a quotation for emphasis. When you have a whole exchange of dialogue, like at least four or more lines back and forth, that constitutes then the dra dramatized scene. Now, there are also a lot of miscellaneous elements, uh, such as exposition, flashbacks, transitions, metaphors, use of slang, use of foreign words, etc., or any other questions that might occur to you of a purely technical nature, which we can take up at the end of the issue of style. There's kind of a whole collection of miscellaneous issues, all of which are issues of method of the how. And uh, those we'll discuss incidentally. But the main thing that uh, I want to discuss with you in relation to style is that first division on which uh, all the lesser ones will depend. That is the issue of selection of the content of what you present and uh, your use of words. The way we will proceed about it today is as follows. I incidentally spend a lot of work today for this class, and I think it will be worth it. I've had some quotations typed, and I'm going to distribute to you these quotations so that you can follow, because we'll later discuss them, and it's easier to have the text before your eyes 
that you don't have to hold it on all in, in your head just uh, at one reading. Now there are quotations which I considered stylistically typical. And they fall in, into three groups. The first and longest one uh, group, there are quotations from six different writers, is the subject of love. Now, I selected, as you see, subjects which could be found in uh, most authors, so that by selecting approximately the same theme, or at least in a general way the same theme, you would be able to see more clearly the difference of approach to the same mm -hmm. subject in many writers. Now, there's this, as I say, the six quotations pertaining to, to the theme of love. I selected those passages which are most typical of that particular writer's approach to the subject. Uh, the next two quotations are on the subject of descriptions of nature, and the next four also on the category of description are all four descriptions of the city of New York. So that right there, having the same subject, you will better be able to see the, the stylistic differences. The, all the selections are numbered. I have deliberately omitted the names of the authors or the books. I know that you'll recognize quite a few of them. But at first, let's not announce and, and make no guesses even if you do guess. I would like at first to let them be anonymous so that for those who don't know some of them, uh, let's discuss them for what they're worth objectively without prejudice about anything we might know of the same author. Or, uh, and it, in that way it would be easier for you to see exactly what the words or the paragraphs themselves convey. Uh, after we finish the reading, then if those who wish me start guessing, and whichever is not guessed, I will then tell you by numbers uh, who the authors are and from which books. Now, naturally, I have more of myself than of anyone else, uh, but for two reasons. Uh, the first one is, of course, my personal preference. The second one, <laughs> uh, what if I didn't consider them good, I would have still been working on them. Therefore, I selected them because I think them good. But practically more important is the fact that those are the ones which we will study in detail in the sense that I will be able to tell you firsthand the full reasoning without deducing it from the writing, but from the firsthand knowledge, all the reasoning of why certain words and things were done in a certain way. And also this will be the passages uh, on which I'll make experiments like I did on the Rock 2 scene. I will later not today, but yes, it's today. I'll show you rewritten versions of it, or changes of words and rearrangement of words to show you what happens uh, when certain changes are made, so, so that my passages will be the experimental passages. Uh, now, I also want to ask you not to read those I had. That will just create confusion in your own mind. I would like you to watch the wording in time with her reading so as to go slowly and absorb thoroughly. And I want you to watch for the two things that I mentioned. Since the first six deal with the subject of love, now the, therefore that is the general subject in one way or another involved in every quote, uh, one of those quotations. Look for the selection of content. That is, watch what kind of elements did the author uh, decide to include in order to project his or her view of love and watch the use of words, the, the structure of the sentences, the kind of words the authors use and in what way. And you will, uh, by seeing the same subject, uh, treated by six totally different writers, uh, you will learn much more about style without even uh, full conscious identification. To tell you the truth, it startled even me when I uh, read them all one after the other. So shall we start? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we will not make any explanation as to what precedes the excerpt. Since they are all out of novels, 
they are all out of context, but self-explanatory as far as it goes. And that uh, your purpose here is not to know the rest of the story, but to see what and how much is conveyed by the excerpts as they stand. She was suddenly aware that they were alone. It was an awareness that stressed the fact, permitting no further implication, yet holding the full meaning of the unnamed in that special stress. They were alone in the silent forest, at the foot of a structure that looked like an ancient temple, and she knew what rite was the proper form of worship to be offered on an altar of that kind. She felt a sudden pressure at the base of her throat, her head leaned back a little, no more than to feel the faint shift of a current against her hair but it was as if she was lying in space against the wind, conscious of nothing but his legs and the shape of his mouth. He stood watching her, his face still, but for the faint movement of his eyelids drawing narrow, as if against too strong a light. It was like the beat of three instants. This was the first, and in the next she felt a stab of ferocious triumph at the knowledge that his effort and his struggle were harder to endure than hers, and then he moved his eyes, and raised his head to look at the inscription on the temple. The next is a different excerpt from the same work. She collapsed face down on the bed. It was not the mere fact of physical exhaustion. It was the sudden monomania of a sensation too complete to endure. While the strength of her body was gone, while her mind had lost the faculty of consciousness, a single emotion drew on her remnants of energy, of understanding, of judgment, of control, leaving her nothing to resist it with or to direct it, making her unable to desire, only to feel, reducing her to a mere sensation, a static sensation without start or goal. She kept seeing his figure in her mind, his figure as he had stood at the door of the structure. She felt nothing else, no wish, no hope, no estimate of her feeling, no name for it, no relation to herself. There was no entity such as herself. She was not a person, only a function, the function of seeing him, and the sight was its own meaning and purpose with no further end to reach. And now quotation number two. This is from a different author. From that day on there was in me a man whom I did not know, I tried to use all my remedies, the cloister, the altar, the work, the books. Folly. Oh, science rings so hollow when one beats against it in despair, a head full of passion. Do you know, young girl, what I always saw henceforth between the book and me? You, your shadow, the image of the luminous apparition that had once moved across the space before me. But that image did not have the same color any longer. It was somber, ominous dark like the black circle that pursues for a long time the sight of the reckless one who has looked fixedly at the sun. Unable to get rid of it, always hearing your song humming in my head, always seeing your feet dancing on my prayer book, always feeling at night in dreams your shape slipping against my flesh. I wanted to see you again, to touch you, to know who you were, to see whether I would find you comparable to the ideal image I had kept of you, to shatter my dream, perhaps, by means of reality. In any case, I hoped that a new impression would efface the first, and the first would become unbearable to me. I sought you. I saw you again. Disaster. When I had seen you twice, I wished to see you a thousand times. I wished to see you always. Then how can one stop on that steep descent into hell? Then I did not belong to myself any longer. The other end of the string that the devil had attached to my wings, he had tied it to your foot. I became a vagrant like you. I waited for you in doorways. I looked for you on street corners. I watched you from the top of my tower. Each evening I returned to my cell, more charmed, more desperate, more bewitched, more lost. Oh, young girl, have pity on me. You believe that you are unhappy. Alas, alas, you do not know what unhappiness is. Oh, to love a woman, to be a priest, to be hated, to love her with all the fury of one's soul, to feel that for the least of her smiles one would give one's blood, one's guts, 
one's character, one's salvation, immortality, and eternity, this life and the next. To regret that one is not king, genius, emperor, archangel, god, that one might place a greater slave under her feet. To embrace her night and day with one's dreams and with one's thoughts, and to see her enamored of a soldier's uniform and to have nothing to offer her but the squalid cassock of a priest that will arouse her fear and her disgust. Do you know what it's like? That agony you are made to endure through the long nights, by your arteries that boil, by your heart that bursts, by your head that splits, by your teeth that bite your hands, by those relentless tortures that keep turning you without respite as upon a red-hot gridiron, upon a thought of love, of jealousy, and of despair. Young girl, mercy, relax for a moment. Toss a few ashes on that flame. Child, torture me with one hand, but caress me with the other. Have pity, young girl, have pity on me. And now for quotation number three. Ah, strange and beautiful, the woman thought. How can I longer bear this joy intolerable, the music of this great song unpronounceable? the anguish of this glory unimaginable, which fills my life to bursting and will not let me speak. It is too hard and not to be endured, to feel the great vine welling in my heart, the wild, strange music swelling in my throat, the triumph of that final perfect song that aches forever there, just at the gateway of my utterance, and that has no tongue to speak. O oh, magic moments that are so perfect, unknown, and inevitable, to stand here at this ship's great side, here at the huge last edge of evening and return, with this still wonder in my heart, and knowing only that somehow we are fulfilled of you, O time. Ah, secret and alone, she thought, how lean with hunger and how fierce with pride, and how burning with impossible desire he bends there at the rail of night, and he is wild and young and foolish and forsaken and his eyes are starved, his soul is parched with thirst, his heart is famished with the hunger that cannot be fed, and he leans there on the rail and dreams great dreams, and he is made for love and has a thirst for glory, and he is so cruelly mistaken and is so right. Ah, see, she thought, how that wild light flames there upon his brow, how bright, how burning, and how beautiful, O oh, passionate and proud, how like the wild lost soul of youth you are, how like my wild lost father who will not return. He turned and saw her then, and so finding her was lost, and so losing self was found, and so seeing her saw for a fading moment only the pleasant image of the woman that perhaps she was and that life saw. He never knew. He only knew that from that moment his spirit was impaled upon the knife of love, from that moment on he never was again to lose her utterly, never to wholly repossess unto himself the lonely, wild integrity of youth which had been his. At that instant of their meeting, that proud inviolability of youth was broken, not to be restored. At that moment of their meeting, she got into his life by some dark magic, and before he knew it, he had her beating in the pulses of his blood. Somehow thereafter, how he never knew, to steal into the conduits of his heart and to inhabit the lone, inviolable tenement of his one life, so like love's great thief, to steal through all the attics of his soul and to become a part of all he did and said and was. Through this invasion, so to touch all loveliness that he might touch, through this strange and subtle stealth of love, henceforth to share all that he might feel or make or dream, until there was for him no beauty that she did not share, no music that did not have her being in it, no horror, madness, hatred, sickness of the soul or grief unutterable that was not somehow consonant to her single image and her million forms, and no final freedom and release brought through the incalculable expenditure of blood and anguish and despair that would not bear upon its brow forever the deep scar, upon its sinews the old, mangling chains of love. Next we'll have quotation number four. Sound of mating birds, sound of spring blossoms dropping in the tranquil air, 
the bark of sleepy dogs at midnight. Who's to set them down and make them anything but hackneyed, and as natural, as conventional, as youthfully gauche, as eternally beautiful and authentic as those ancient sounds was the talk of Martin and Leora in that passionate half-hour when each found in the other a part of his own self, always vaguely missed, discovered now with astonished joy. They rattled like hero and heroine of a sticky tale, like sweatshop operatives, like bouncing rustics, like prince and princess. Their words were silly and inconsequential, heard one by one, yet taken together they were as wise and important as the tides or the sounding wind. And now, quotation number five. They went into his room and took off their clothes, smiling at each other and without self-consciousness. Johnny was undressed first, and he lay down on the bed, his hands behind his head, watching her. Shireen turned, stepped out of her petticoat, and faced him. Her eyes had turned dark, and her face lapsed into sudden, serious intensity, as if she wondered how he would find her, but also as if she had lost Shireen Delaney, and came toward him only as a woman, a part of time, and every woman who ever lived. She sat beside him on the bed, leaning forward, one hand lifting and moving to touch his hair. He reached out and took hold of her, and all at once he grinned. Chocolate cake with peppermint frosting, that's you. His hands touched her breasts lightly. You're all the flavors wrapped up in one package. Shireen gave a sudden, triumphant, ringing laugh, and he pulled her down against him. And now, quotation number six. In recollection's light, first to be noted was the plain fact that by standards of what was later learned, the feelings affording a young man his state of love, of being in love, were largely factious. This was not by any means to say that they are false or pretended, but still they had not, as the young man himself was likely to imagine, arisen spontaneously. In theory, the feelings resulted when love magically and mysteriously seized on him. In theory, that was what love did. In practice, love did nothing of the kind. He, the truth usually was, seized on love. A young man heard and read of a thing called love. Love was praised everywhere as pure, noble, and beautiful. Love did have to do with the commerce between the sexes, but love as described clearly could not have to do with sex the physical urges of nature that he knew about. Those had been denounced to him as evil and impure. The associates of what he joined in calling, even if he fairly frequently indulged in them, dirty jokes, dirty thoughts, dirty practices. What those were must be everything true love wasn't. Love knew them not. Love manifestly was out of this world. Love's high feelings at once, so exciting and so presentable, could moreover be had apparently by anyone. A young man would not be long in resolving to have some. The next is another quotation from the same work. To the rules of high-mindedness, the flesh is imperfectly amenable. Kisses, however chaste, caresses, however decent, if the exchange of them is kept up, must have the flesh soon shaping to its natural end, projecting its actual objective. A discipline of mind was required. The witching hour was to be saved intact by a division of consciousness, one part excluding rigidly all that engaged the other part. Held separate, thoughts on the plane of moonlight and roses could proceed regardless of the lower animal, or at least they could so proceed to a point. Due to that blameless neglect of hopes, to call a halt, she, the fair, the chaste, the inexpressive she, had no need to call. And to her partner in Petting's reluctance to leave, since he was free to remain, there had been awkward occasions when the animal, disregarded by the hour and teased too far, reacted of a sudden, put to the shilly-shally so long imposed its own unpreventable end. Arthur Winner, Jr., confusion in the moonlight, dismay among the roses, was obliged to conceal as well as he could a crisis about which his single shamed consolation was that hope, anything but knowing, would never know what had happened. Pause for a moment. That is the end of the 
love selections and no comments. Do you see differences? <laughs> Do you see metaphysical differences? Do you see philosophy sticking out all over and directing every word of this? We'll take it up in further detail later. All right, now the next six are the scriptures. First, first two, the general description of nature, more or less, and the last four specifically of New York. She sat at the window of the train, her head thrown back, not moving, wishing she would never have to move again. The telegraph poles went racing past the window, but the train seemed lost in a void between a brown stretch of prairie and a solid spread of rusty, graying clouds. The twilight was draining the sky without the wound of a sunset. It looked more like the fading of an anemic body in the process of exhausting its last drops of blood and light. The train was going west, as if it too were pulled to follow the sinking rays and quietly to vanish from the earth. She sat still, feeling no desire to resist it. Next is quotation number eight. The road rises more than 500 feet and winds through tall pine forest. From time to time, this opens and affords a magnificent view over large stretches of land below. Now, in the afternoon sun, the trunks of the fir trees were turning red and the landscape far away seemed cool, all blue and pale gold. Boris was able now to believe what the old gardener at the convent had told him when he was a child that he had once seen about this time of the year and the day, a herd of unicorns come out of the woods to graze upon the sunny slopes. The white and dappled mares, rosy in the sun, treading daintily and looking around for their young. The old stallion, darker roan, sniffing and pawing the ground. The air here smelled of fir leaves and toadstools and was so fresh that it made him yawn. And yet he thought it was different from the freshness of spring. The courage and gaiety of it were tinged with despair. It was the finale of the symphony. And now, quotation number nine. From the train, he looked back once at the skyline of the city as it flashed into sight and was held for some moments beyond the windows. The twilight had washed off the details of the buildings. They rose in thin shafts of a soft porcelain blue, a color not of real things, but of evening and distance. They rose in bare outlines, like empty molds waiting to be filled. The distance had flattened the city. The single shafts stood immeasurably tall, out of scale to the rest of the earth. They were of their own world, and they held up to the sky the statement of what man had conceived and made possible. They were empty molds, but man had come so far he could go farther. The city on the edge of the sky held a question and a promise. Quotation number 10. Clouds had wrapped the sky and had descended as fog to wrap the streets below, as if the sky were engulfing the city. She could see the whole of Manhattan Island, a long triangular shape cutting into an invisible ocean. It looked like the prow of a sinking ship. A few tall buildings still rose above it like funnels, but the rest was disappearing under gray-blue coils, going down slowly into vapor and space. This was how they had gone, she thought. Atlantis, the city that sank into the ocean, and all the other kingdoms that vanished, leaving the same legend in all the languages of men, and the same longing. And now, the eleventh quote. Nobody ever walked across the bridge, not on a night like this. The rain was misty enough to be almost fog-like, a cold gray curtain that separated me from the pale ovals of white that were faces locked behind the steamed-up windows of the cars that hissed by. Even the brilliance that was Manhattan by night was reduced to a few sleepy yellow lights off in the distance. Some place over there I had left my car and started walking, burying my head in the collar of my raincoat with the night pulled in around me like a blanket. I walked and I smoked and I flicked the spent butts ahead of me and watched the march to the pavement and fizzle out with one last wink. If there was life behind the buildings on either side of me, I didn't notice it. The street was mine, all mine. They gave it to me gladly and wondered why I wanted it so nice and all alone. 
That hour, that moment, and that place struck with a peerless coincision upon the very heart of his own youth, the crest and zenith of his own desire. The city had never seemed as beautiful as it looked that night. For the first time he saw that New York was supreme among the cities of the world, the city of the night. There had been achieved here a loveliness that was astounding and incomparable, a kind of modern beauty inherent to its place and time that no other place nor time could match. He realized suddenly that the beauty of other cities of the night, of Paris spread below one from the butte of Sacre-Cœur in its vast, mysterious blossoms of nocturnal radiance, of London with its smoky numbus of fogged light, which was so peculiarly thrilling because it was so vast, so lost in the illimitable, had each its special quality so lovely and mysterious, but had yet produced no beauty that could equal this. The city blazed there in his vision in the frame of night, and for the first time his vision phrased it as it had never done before. It was a cruel city, but it was a lovely one, a savage city, yet it had such tenderness, a bitter, harsh, and violent catacomb of stone and steel and tunneled rock, slashed savagely with light, and roaring, fighting a constant ceaseless warfare of men and of machinery and yet it was so sweetly and so delicately pulsed, as full of warmth, of passion, and of love, as it was full of hate. Now, this is what we will be analyzing for some time. Now, uh, does anyone want to make any guesses, and then we will proceed on the discussion. Yes. I'd like to ask a question. It's not a guess, but it's connected with what the chicken was. Is the second item about love translated? Yes. How did you know that? From, from, there were many things in the style, many things that were translated as sort of uh, incongruous use of words, words like folly and enamored, along with words like guts and squalid. And um, if they were not translated, then this is very important, it seems to me, in the question of the style. But if it is, of course, it just means it's an inconsistent translation. Right. <coughs> very, very observant. Okay. Yes? I'd like to thank you exactly to the author of the second collection. I haven't read this to you go, but from what I've heard about it, it sounds like it was in the yeah, correct. Um, uh, now, the first one, you know, that's that yeah. Uh The second one is Victor Hugo Notre Dame de Paris, mm -hmm. translated by yours truly. And here I have... I want <laughs> no, no, quite proper. I wanted to... Uh, make explanation about this. But uh, I have a Hugo only in French and about translation, and I found that they omit whole sentences, change meanings, censor things that are too strong, and I was horrified to realize that those of you who don't read French have not really read Victor Hugo. That is, the general meaning is the same. But it's precisely the, the better kind of sentences and the more st stronger ones that, that are either omitted because they were too hard to translate or translated by a bad approximation. Uh, so I did this myself today and the words I got, I had to because, and I posed them. And you're very right that it's not in that style. The French word I'm trying, uh, it's not quite intestines in English. But, you know, the, but the funny point is that in the context of the way uh, in French they would use that word, the nearest equivalent is the English guts, except that to put guts into the 15th century is kind of difficult. Yet the uh, content meaning, mm -hmm. that was the nearest word for what he intended there. So I spent a day day translating this. And uh, for admirers of Hebrew, I'll tell you afterwards, what terrible changes they made in other parts uh, than this one. For instance, those who've read Notre Dame, you know, that's the free speech. And it goes on. I mean, that's a long scene for about 10 pages. I just took the representative passages. But it's just as an illustration. This is totally an aside. There is a line in there. It's, just, it's the priest, you see, who is in love with the street dancer, gypsy girl. And he tells her in the original, uh, you were so beautiful, that's describing his first impression of her, you were so beautiful that God would have preferred you to the Virgin and would have wanted to be born of you when he decided to become man, which is quite 
a good line, particularly coming from a medieval period. In the modern library translation, they put it, you were so beautiful that you could be the mother of the great. Oh. Oh. I think that is literally a crime. Uh, because they made it antiquity, you see, rather than religion, and, and wrecked the whole point and the whole course of it. Uh, now, and there's smaller changes of that kind. In a line where, that's included here, where he says he was, he was king, emperor, etc., arch archangel, and God, to offer her a slave, they cut out God. Is that the kind of religious fear? Looks like religious censorship. It looks like an old translation, it doesn't say who can translate it, but it looks like a 19th century translation. And uh, so then there's a line about how at night he felt as if her, her form was sleeping against his flesh in the American translation. At night I dreamed of you. <laughs> so you see what they do to a writer. And since it was style, uh, I wanted to approximate as nearly as I could both his content and the intention, the equivalent in the warm dress, uh, uh, as he would have done in French, as he did do it. It actually gave me the desire to translate his novel, uh, if I could only take the time, because it's a crime. So that when you uh, read it in English, and I know, that you'll feel an awful lot of bromide, don't be too sure that it's his. It's a translator's easy, lazy equivalent. All right, now the third one. I would guess on this one. I'm not sure I can't tell the content of all because I've never read it before, but the style is like the style of Thomas Wolfe. That's right. Right, Thomas Wolfe uh, of Time in the River. Uh, number four. Well, I think you all know that, because the names are in Aerosmith, Sinclair Lewis. Now, number five, I bet you you don't know. The title of this work is The Starveling, and it was written by Kathleen Windsor. And six, I think everybody gets too. Just that follows. Well, of course, that's James Goldberg. Didn't you know that? I never read it. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Is it impossible? The book is war. I had to, uh, if you, this is real obscenity if you see what it means. Yes. Yet I selected uh, the most the readable and the most respectable passages. Uh, there are passages that uh, are literarily and particularly philosophically totally inexcusable, but they cannot be read in civilized society. Read literally. It's a four letter word, and it's not only that, because, all right, you can accept four letter words for what they are. It's the intention behind the passages is so obscene. I'm not even speaking of sex, but the sex passages, some of them there are unreadable. No, I'll just tell you in a brief way. Dealing philosophically, mind you, with bathroom functions. And in effect saying, uh, what's man and what's romanticism? It's a blatant attack on uh, what he calls critifying life, you see, meaning romanticizing, when men have to go to the bathroom. Only he didn't put it that elegantly. Uh, now, if, if we had read that passage, it would have to re literally stop the re re rest of the lesson because you can't enter that into a literary discussion. But I'm just warning you, Russian and look it up if you have morbid curiosity, because it is ghastly. But these passages indicate to you what the nature of the gentleman is, if you remember that those are the most respectable. All right, now, seven you know, that, that was seven. Eight. Does anyone know eight? That's Isaac Benison's In Seven Gothic Tales. Nine is not Atlas Shug, but do you know it? That's it. Ten is Atlas Shug. Now eleven. Who knows it? Of those, of those who don't know. Nicky Spillane, that's right. One of them is the very opening. Oh, and twelve? 
Now what we will do is to start analyzing the essentials of the method for the style of all these quotations. Uh, I don't think we'll get all the six on love today. We certainly won't go beyond that, but at least we'll cover a few. And I want, first of all, to tell you what we're going to look for. Primarily, what is accomplished in the quotation, and then by what means is it accomplished. Uh, first, we'll, uh, for each one of them, we will identify what is the what, and then the how. <coughs> Uh, and uh, when we come to the later ones, uh, you'll see, as has been mentioned here already, that some of the authors contradict their obvious intention in, in what they have written. Then it will be valuable to figure out what in the manner of writing gives us that evidence. We will necessarily touch on philosophy and epistemology here because you will see in what manner the, the mere choice of words let alone the choice of content, implies certain philosophy, all of these selections. Uh, but the philosophy here would be interesting only as a side issue in the sense of what kind of premises automatically will give you a certain manner of expression. What I want you to focus on primarily is what was the specific assignment of the author in each particular quotation in the sense in which I open this discussion with giving you one very dryly synopsis, synopsis like sentence. In that sense, naming first the essential what is the paragraph about, we then proceed to see by what means that has been done. Watching, as I told you at the beginning, for the two things, the selection of the content of what's named and the way the words are used. Now, uh, first, Let's take my two quotations, which is the, uh, quotation number one from Atlas Shrug. Incidentally, the reason I included both of them is because to balance all the other quotations that we have here, I wanted to present, in effect, the essence of each author's attitude towards love and way of handling it. Uh, now, either one of these would have been too brief, but I selected those as most, most representative of my manner. If you notice, most of the quotations, with the possible exception of Lewis, involve both love and sex. It would be very hard to separate it, but Lewis managed it. Uh, uh, how, however, uh, focusing on love is more revealing, because when writers begin to write about sex, sometimes it's uh, simply confusing. Uh, it would be harder to identify the style than on their approach to love. And in this particular subject, the value is that all of these writers deal with the same issue and that uh, it's not a matter of <coughs> avoiding bromides or uh, <coughs> being afraid of uh, censorship restrictions. Uh, as, for instance, about sex in the 19th century now, so it will be hard to tell what is the author's actual approach or what are the requirements of the time. Uh, now, let's uh, f first of all observe that, in fact, in all the six quotations we have read, the purpose was, each time, of the author to present uh, love in a general sense, but most particularly the nature of the intensity of love. Uh, all the ones that I selected were concerned with that, with some violent or extreme presentation of that feeling. Now, let's see how it's done. First of all, on my quotation, and taking it as a whole, that is, I long for the break, but taking it as two presentations of the psychology of the feeling about, of one woman about the same person, in fact, the same day, do you get the overall impression 
that what is being presented here is a very violent, very strong law. Is there anyone who does not, and I now don't mean to hold a gun at your head, you know, it's not a question of politeness or flattery. Is there anyone who did not get that impression? Because if you didn't, that would be an interesting question to discuss also technically and impersonally. Or would you all say of your own first-hand judgment, being as objective as you can about the fact that the author is speaking to you, did you get the impression that the feeling which Dagen projects here is a very violent, a very serious feeling? And if so, the first question stylistically to ask is by what means did I project it? Now here, I would like to ask you questions, but I don't want an overall free discussion. Therefore, uh, whoever raises his hand first will be the only sp spokesman. Uh, who would care to name the essential? Not every particular, but just the essential of the method. <laughs> Very good. You know, you amaze me in a certain sense uh, about your stylistic sensitivity. Had you taken courses on this before, or is that your own judgment? Well, judgment. I do, that, that's why I say amazed, in, uh, in the sense that uh, since you haven't written yet, or not professionally, nor taken any courses, it's remarkable and I compliment you. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's right. The essence here uh, <laughs> is that I project it strictly by means of giving you the concrete. Uh, and the kind of concrete, which, assuming a rational reader, and I don't assume any other, would necessarily lead to the abstraction that this is a very strong feeling. Now, uh, let us suppose someone coming on this quotation cold, without knowing the rest of the story, would say, by what means does he... Uh, no, we're supposed to know that this is not just a light infatuation. Well, the answer would be that the kind of concrete given would not apply to that. Uh, why? Because observe the intensity of what she experienced. Now, my method here is to give the concrete that would lead to the kind of abstraction I intended, but the concretes have to be selected very, very carefully. A random uh, collection of concretes would not do. Therefore, I had to select the kind of concretes which would constitute what I called before writing by means of essence. I would select those touches of what she experienced that would be essential. They would be specific, but essential to what she feels, and by that means pro project the nature of her feeling. Now here, I want you to observe an epistemological question. Uh, the first question that anyone should ask me stylistically is, well, now why did I choose this method? And the reason is as follows. I choose the method of reproducing human epistemology in exactly the, the right, the same way as it is experienced in reality. Uh, again, assuming certain kind of characters, such as Dagny, which would not be uh, uh, a woman who experienced vague, vague package deals without knowing what she experienced. Is that what her psychology incidentally I showed that exactly that in Taggart, uh, psychology or in his packages. But Remembering Dagny's characterization, my method of approach to projecting this feeling would be in this moment when she's fully aware, when she focuses on effect for the first time that day on what she feels for Rod. I beg your pardon. Please strike it off the record, brother. Uh, what she feels for both. Uh, she would not be thinking of her whole philosophy, or I am madly in love, or love is an important value, etc. One does not think of that. Uh, that is, I would try to project what would be the focus, the essence of the kind of an emotion of which she would be aware in that moment. And then I try to reproduce it. 
incidentally, as an aside, uh, in regard to the naturalistic method, it may be quite possible that right in the moment, in this moment, uh, maybe a bird flew across the trees, or a butterfly was fluttering somewhere. She might even possibly have been aware of it uh, on the marginal edge of her consciousness. But to include that would have been totally disastrous. Now, that would have been the method of including accidental <coughs> details non-selectively. I had to focus only on the essential of the setting, if you notice, and the essential of what she felt. To project the full reality of that scene, I had to mention not merely what she feels, but also what is it that she feels in response to. It wasn't a sudden introspective emotion. She felt it in regard to looking at gold in a certain place and time in a certain context and observes that what I do is I give you the essence of the setting which creates the kind of mood that blends with her emotion. Now, for instance, take the first two sentences. And uh, give me the translation. Who would like to tell me in synopsis form what the meaning? I mean, what, was, what was my assignment to myself? What was I to cover in these two sentences? Who wants to say that? Just one speaker. <coughs> yes? Do you mean Joan Bankman had died and got her alone in the atmosphere of salt? Uh, Something like that? No, what, uh, whichever you guess, uh, to have been the, the essential assignment. Still? I would say it was to <coughs> set the physical setting, which was that they were going towards the powerhouse, and that she was tremendously physically aware of it. Uh, you're right. Uh, though the first is not quite right, because this is after. Uh, they're standing in front of the powerhouse, and that passage comes after she has uh, looked at the powerhouse and sort of its meaning, and then she looks at him. But what is important here was the assignment. Suggest her sudden physical awareness. That is, this is the suggestion of sex. But you see, I never mentioned the word, and I never say it directly. Uh, observe the means. All that she's conscious of is an a stressed awareness that permits no further implication, yet holds the full meaning of their name in that special stress. Uh, that is the sudden sexual awareness, consciousness. Uh, and <coughs> the deliberate hint or the implication to the reader is she knew what right was the proper form of worship to be offered on an altar of that kind. This, of course, would not be fully objective in that quotation alone, but was in the context because it follows a very inspired uh, description of the meaning of his temple, of his invention, that is inspired in her terms. It's thoroughly planted by then what she feels towards achievement and, and towards greatness. And therefore, since it had been planted, that she feels that sex is the expression of one's highest values and of achievement. That statement, she knew what right was the proper form of worship, would be literarily a much stronger method of accomplishing my purpose than if I had said, and therefore she felt she wanted to sleep with him, or any equivalent of it, even supposing I said it in some proper literary form. The reason this is epistemologically stronger is because I make the reader do the connection. And this I wanted to mention to you as an example of how I make rational human epistemology the guide in my selection of both the content of what I'm going to include in this scene and the way I use words. Namely, I try to present the material in the same form in which a perceptive human mind would see it in reality. In any given situation or scene, no one sees everything. So we are not cameras in that sense either. Uh, that is, we see that which has particular reason to interest us, or out of a complex 
evidence, we will be focusing on that which our interests or our values require. Therefore, I try to present the essence of any scene because I substitute in that sense my selectivity for the readers. I leave him no room to fo focus on anything else. I present the evidence in a kind of manner in which the, I want the reader to see it. Uh, meaning, if you, reader, are to get something out of the reality that I present, I present those highlights, those essentials, which I want you to observe by reading it. You will be observing reality the way I observe it. But you will be observing it according to the normal uh, human epistemology, which is to observe it from a certain viewpoint. Now, I hope this is not confusing. It, 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 uh, it isn't forcing something non-objective on the reader. It is merely following this kind of principle. All projection, uh, all perception is selective. I will do the selectivity, and if I allow the reader to be aware only of this focus, undiluted, then, by rational epistemology, he, his awareness will follow as if the material is actual reality, but it will follow from a certain value choice. He can then make up his mind on uh, what he thinks of this value, which is a different and private method, but the material is, is handled as any epistemology will be handling uh, any evidence, only the slant, the focus, is selective. That is why this is objective and very highly slanted writing. And that is not a contradiction in terms. Slanted in the sense that I select the focus. And in that sense, that is the premise of any type of romantic writing. And I'm very consciously practicing it. An objective in the sense that I do not tell the reader what I want him to feel. And I do not narrate or tell him what I want him to see. I show it. I, in effect, say, I want you to see Dagny's great feeling. I'm giving you the essence of it. Now, you can perceive it, judge accordingly. But I want your own mind to make all the connections. And it's in that sense that uh, I found it much stronger to remind the reader that in Dagny's mind, the sight of a great achievement would lead to the sort of step. I condensed into the line, she knew what right was the proper form of worship to be offered on an altar of that kind. That is a way of saying uh, that she considers sex a high value, that she considers a, a, a sacred value, Con, uh, which I invoke by means of the connotations of such a word as temple or altar or rite. <clears throat> this is deliberately selecting words which have a certain objective meaning, and the objective meaning is what? Connotation to religion or to high values. I make the reader connect, in effect, in his mind, lightning like if he's a rational reader who is reading this in full focus. Uh, Oh yes, she would feel that way because I know about her, what her attitude is toward love and toward achievement. Now, the next sentence then uh, is deliberately bringing from the abstract to the immediate moment. I mean, to make you feel, to give it the physical reality, the sensory reality of just what she would experience. But again, observe to what extent it's slanted. Uh, she felt a sudden pressure at the base of her throat. Oh, that's obviously sexual emotion. But then uh, her head leans back, and uh, she, she feels a faint shift of a current against her head. That's a purely sensuous description. But it was a seashore lying back in space. Oh, that's obvious, deliberate uh, stress on, you know, what connotation that would have. Uh, and the strongest line here, stylistically, I think is conscious of nothing but his leg, legs in the shape of his mouth. Had I said conscious of nothing but him, it wouldn't be worth a cent. 
because it would be too generalized. All right, we know that she's looking at him. Then to say she is conscious of him doesn't say much. It's again the principle that the concrete. What is she conscious of? His legs and his mouth. In some other context where uh, the issue is more intellectual, she perhaps will be much more conscious of his eyes. But it's giving those two aspects which give it the sex uh, stress. The emphasis deliberately on she's conscious of one particular aspect of him, or rather one purpose. And it's done again by breaking a generalized statement, such as conscious of nothing but him, into the particular uh, aspect of him that she's conscious of in this moment. Uh, now I do the same in the next sentence in relation to him. Uh, first, only a very specific physical description, the same movement of his eyelids drawing narrow. But what gives the point of this sentence is as if against uh, uh, too strong a light. Now you know there is no strong light involved here exactly. Therefore, what the connotation is too strong a feeling. Uh, the connotation is against something too strong. That's all that I want to suggest. The context does the rest. Uh, now the last sentence is almost self-explanatory in, in the sense of technique. Because what I, and it was a difficult thing to do here. Because what I wanted, and you'll find in emotional scenes, that that's one of the difficult technical issues, to project something as if the reader would grasp it as one issue. That which epistemologically in real life you would experience almost as one package deal. But, and in reading, my intention is to let the reader think that he experienced it, the whole sentence as one. But, in fact, you can't experience the whole sentence as one. The writer has to give the steps. And therefore the trick here is to start by saying it was like the beat of three instruments. I've already unified it into one whole. Then I break it down into what kind of three instruments. And they add up together to exactly the kind of progression which in real life would probably take about half, half a minute, if that. Oh, much less than that. <laughs> kind of like one emotional uh, impact, almost simultaneous, but made of three different elements. Incidentally, that technique of projecting very specifically something which you want your reader to experience as if it were one blow, I use very effectively in the scene where Francisco and Reardon are at the mouth of the furnace, if you remember, and Reardon saves his life, where Francisco sleeps. <coughs> now, the problem there was that, in fact, in following real epistemology, that whole scene would have taken a split second. Uh, that they didn't have to act very fast. Yes, there were tremendous uh, considerations, emotions, and implications going on in that split second. Do you remember how I did it? But somewhat similar technique is here. I said it was two minutes or, uh, which she grasped after they were over. And then I go for almost half a page describing each minute separately. But by means of that kind of technique, I've already unified them into one epistemological impact. Now, I wanted to point this out to you. Pardon? Which? At the mouth of the furnace. Yeah. If I remember, you said it took less than a minute. Something like that. It wasn't because it was, uh, I always remembered that as a statement uh, of, uh, it happened so fast, it was aware of it only in retrospect. Yeah. It's the sequence of events. Yeah. I think if I remember what you said, it was not two minutes, but I think less than a minute or half a minute fraction. Of Something like that. I honestly can't even remember. I don't know my word by heart, I'm sorry to say. But okay. I know that the, uh, whichever the wording, the method, the, the stylistic trick was the same as here. And, and I uh, quote this as an illustration of my particular principle, which is to follow actual human epistemology. 
that is the, uh, to achieve the effect of the reader really perceiving this directly without the author being present. Mm -hmm. see, this is what I meant by slanted and objective writing at the same time. At no time uh, will you ha find a passage in which you would obviously have to say that it's the author speaking. The author in my style is never speaking at all, and yet the author is pulling every string very consciously. What do I mean by the author never speaking? In the sense that I never assert anything, I never tell, I show. Now, if I have some uh, unimportant connecting sentence, such as they walked toward the car, well, that is telling, uh, not showing. But then, by the mere fact of it being an unimportant sequence, there is nothing actually to show. That is, in that sense, if it's a transition uh, connection of some kind, that is the way you would, in fact, experience it. Again, on the principle of human perception being selective, that I suppose you're in the middle of some important conversation with someone and you're walking toward the car, you would be aware, barely, that yes, I'm going in that direction, but that isn't where your focus would be. And then, uh, therefore, I use that same kind of method in my uh, choice of the words I use and the kind of content uh, of what I will choose to describe. If I say they walk towards the car, that is not being <coughs> using the narrative method uh, in the sense of telling you rather than showing because in fact then, nothing there is to be shown. But uh, what I avoid is, and you'll see by <laughs> contrast when we get to the other style, uh, what this telling versus showing method really consists of, what I avoid is ever presenting you which, with something which needed the author's assertion for you to grasp. Or something which was not presented to you as direct sensory evidence. Uh, here it is. Do you re realize that you are given nothing but concrete, objective facts, but slanted in such a way that you will have only the impression that I intended you to have? Now, the same consideration applies to the second paragraph quoted. Now, here is one of the most difficult of all assignments, and you, you'll see in the other writers the same problem. That is to present a violent emotion. A violent emotion, if it is violent, is experienced actually in this form, as you probably would all know by introspection. The more violent the emotion, the less you are able to identify what is it made of. You just feel it. It seems like an irreducible primary, which is incidentally one of the reasons why so many people are mistaken about the source of emotion. But it is experienced as if it's just one thing. I feel something violently and there are no words for it and it can't be broken down into anything. Now the assignment here was to break it down into the kind of concrete which Dagny would not really be thinking of but which the reader will be summing up into a tremendous monomania, single emotion. Now observe that what I'm doing here is establishing it in effect or in part by means of negatives. I am telling you what it is that she did not have. Now, if I had said she felt nothing but uh, her emotion for the memory of uh, the, the sight of gold at the foot of the temple. That's just merely telling you. Now, why do I make it specific? By what means? <coughs> By saying that uh, a single emotion drew on her remnants of energy, of understanding, of judgment, of control. I concretize the kind of normal element present in the consciousness, which she now is using. It's by concretizing that that I call attention to the fact that now it's a single violent sensation, leaving her nothing to resist it with or to direct it. Again, I'm reminding you, normally she would not be at the mercy of a single emotion or at least she would know how to direct it. But 
uh, now all of this she hasn't got and that gives you some idea what is it that she has got what is the actual state of her consciousness now another realistic trick here and this is the means by which I project that what she feels here is love and why I select this passage it's more uh, love than sex actually not that it's opposed to sex but it's the essence of love you see if I had had her after all these preparations say that what was in her mind was the desire to kiss him or the desire to sleep with him the realization that this is the man she loves that would not have been as strong as telling you that she's reduced to nothing but seeing his figure in her mind which is exactly the way it would be as the experience that is such a conclusion as I am in love with him or I want to marry him those are already abstractions those are thoughts those will be later results mm -hmm. the actual emotion would be experienced precisely in some such form the extreme awareness of the other person by making it almost platonic in the sense that all she was able to experience is only that vision of him that is what makes it the essence of falling in love I see so many people smiling uh, uh, do I gather that it did make that impression on you? go ahead okay, I can sum up by saying by saying that uh, I have had I take it off to you <laughs> thank you I, I, from you I appreciate it because uh, you're sensitive to those things but why uh, I saw you not, nodding with great pleased astonishment may I just wonder psychologically this is a complete revelation to me I never thought of uh, the putting out the concrete as the person with the first experience of concrete and that experience of thought and when you put down the concrete it is when the reader is thinking along with you not when you just sit down Oh, you mean that that had not occurred to you before as a method? No, not at all. This is... uh, but tell me, are you were you aware of the fact that what I am now describing is the overall, the summed up impression that you had of the yes. of, of this paragraph, or am I wrong about that? You're right. Uh, I had the this is just a guessing game. Psychologically, you had the look. I see. Uh, Oh, that's what made it, but I didn't know that that's what made it. Am I right? Yeah. Well, then I'm very pleased with both of us. Thank you. <laughs> now, the conclusion of it, you see, for instance, where the last sentence does convey just what I was describing. The site was its own meaning and purpose with no further end to reach. I mean, that is the extreme state of being in love. In the most generalized way, where it's not even an issue of sex, not, not an issue of any purpose, but just, uh, if, if you were to put it in colloquial terms, only being aware that he exists and that that fills the whole world. Now that, in a very generalized way, is the stylistic tricks or the methods used in my protection. And now let's go to number two, which is the Victor Hugo quotation from Notre Dame. <coughs> now, who would like to be first to say again, uh, as we did with the first one, what was the overall purpose, if you were to put it in one sentence, that the author had to accomplish in this passage? One of the students responded that it was to convey the desperate intensity of the priest's conflict and his passion for Esmeralda. I think it's mm -hmm. a slightly more complex purpose than that. It seems to me that his purpose was to show the intensity of the conflict and also to show that the priest was mistaken. What mistaken? In the values which he had done. Yes. At least that's what he succeeded in doing, it seems to me. Uh -huh. In other words, the priest assumes that this um, passion that he feels is evil. Mm -hmm. And I think that the author also has his purpose to indicate that this was not the case. Oh, well, now that is what, uh, by conflict. Now, what kind yeah, of conflict is the next mind. point? Oh, it? Uh, no, that's, a, that's the next point. The first point in the sense of what is the purpose in the context of the story. I it is to show the conflict and the intensity of the conflict and the intensity of the passion. Now, the estimate 
is the next point. Now, you have the impression that he at the same time was on the side of the priest? I have the impression that he felt the priest was mistaken in assigning this, uh, an evil nature to this passion. <laughs> That's very interesting, you know, because I think so too. And I'm not sure Hugo intended it. And that was very interesting philosophically. Uh, <coughs> do you know that I had that feeling? That I could uh, really, by certain touches in that scene, not in the passages quoted, I can almost tell you, without ever knowing his biography, what kind of slight autobiographical touches would have been involved, because I know the, the process by which one blows up from house numbers, in effect, it, or street fights into a, uh, something which would not be literally autobiographical, but I think I know on what he based this. Wouldn't you guess from it that you write his biography? There's a tremendous resentment against someone in love with inferiors, which he must have experienced in his life, because uh, that comes over and over again in that whole passage, but that uh, kind of in a stressed way. Yeah. which will be one of the touches by which uh, he, uh, Hugo, is more in sympathy with the previous abasement than his conscious conviction permits him to be. But now, first, the overall question. In the same way in which we think what was the essential of my stylistic approach, who would want to name what is the essential of Hugo's stylistic approach? I mean, by what means does he achieve the purpose which, as we define, is to present an intense conflict and an intense passion. Now, again, the intensity is conveyed by means of concrete. He doesn't say, I suffered and I thought of you. He gives you a concrete, which I'll cite in a moment. What? Well, just the, the specific device that he uses is uh, an imaginary, not dialogue, because she doesn't answer, but speech or series of speeches to the girl. Oh, yes. Well, it isn't imaginary. Are you, uh, it, he is, he is saying all this to her? Oh, yes. It's a long I, scene. I see. I, I, uh, whatever you see that, that is cut. It's a long scene where, you see, she's in jail uh, through deliberate action of his own. Or I shouldn't t tell plot to those who intend to read it. I won't tell the plot, but only to indicate that he's talking to her, but that during the scene she has a few answers but only in a very minor way. And there are a few descriptions once in a while of uh, the scene, but very minimal. Primarily the scene, which is 10 pages in my edition of the book, consists of his speech. It's almost a long uninterrupted speech with just a few remarks about how he looked or how his voice sounded and a few answers from her. But this is said to the girl. I didn't realize it because you had only single, but you had only one set of questions, but you had all the other set of uh, In other words, you do not have quotation showing that it's a quotation. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I, I, I can see that uh, that would give you that impression, but it was not fully re relevant mm -hmm. to the nature of grasping uh, the method and style of presentation. You see, what I was concerned with here is not the structure of a scene, because the scene is much too long to have copied, but just the essence of the method by which Hugo projects his view of a great love. Even though here it is a guilty love. Are you going to comment when you get through it on the differences between him and you in addition to just the particular way he fulfills his purpose? I wanted to ask that right uh, here, because that we don't have to go into extensively. Uh, but uh, that I wanted to point out to you. Now, we just identified what is the common method between us. And again, that would uh, apply to the romantic school. Now, who can tell the difference? There's something, uh, Ian, uh, that he says, it's, it's like there's too much in, in certain passages. I have the sense that, it's, that you would edit it before you would publish it. it that you would cut out certain repetitions. There's always certain things that are said over and over and over in a way which don't fully add to the preceding one. And that's true, but that is a, a description. Can you name the principle uh, that would make that difference? We're in well, left out of the connection <laughs> and Atlas, so it's let the reader's own mind make them. Doesn't he, in a number of instances, state them? In a sentence, for example, like, 
I wanted to see you again, to touch you, to know who you were. All this was completely implied in that, but this is the kind of feeling Dagny was having. No, but the, here it is a sub, somewhat different context, because uh, here, this is uh, a, a narrative. At this point, there was a break in the tape, and a small portion of the dialogue is missing. One of the ways in which he attempts to show the extreme violence of the priest's emotion is by breaking down the logical progression, a logical sequence of ideas in within the speech. In your scene, there was a a logical progression with no repetition. Oh, but and in this, there is no amount of repetition, and he sort of jumps quite a bit into from one short sentence to another short sentence, and then goes back. Uh, to an idea which you stated before. Uh, well, now, here we have to uh, set up ourselves one epistemological rule, and that is that none of these uh, quotations deal with literally and exactly the same subject. Impossible. To do that, I would have to gather all those authors in one room, and we all would have to write on exactly the same assignment if you wanted to identify different that. Uh, one second. Uh, therefore, what you have to keep in mind is only that the general assignment is the same in a generalized way, as I said at the beginning, that's presentation of an intense emotion of love. But aside from that, you have to learn to distinguish between the method of conveying what he has to convey and the fact that in every one of those quotations, the particular situation is somewhat different. Therefore, when a, a a priest who feels guilty of his love makes a confession about it to the girl. Mm -hmm. uh, necessarily, the method would be somewhat different than when I project what Dagny feels in her own mind. So that here, the fact that he might repeat himself or go uh, break the logical sequence would not be a difference of method. What you have to look for is more abstract differences than that. I don't want a general discussion now, so... Uh, if you're not clear on it, to save us time, I will state to you and then show you where it shows what are certain differences in principle. But now let me uh, point out to you what one difference is, but he's somewhat more inclined to permit a certain amount of comment from the character himself and therefore the author uh, than I would have used. Uh, for instance, it, just in the stylistic method, when he says, uh, but that image did not have the same color any longer. It was somber, ominous, dark like the black circle that pursues for a long time the sight of the reckless one who has looked fixedly at the sun. And that's an exact translation of the French sentence as I could manage. And here is stylistically now the issue. It is that a man talking of a passion might use a metaphor if it expresses his feeling exactly. It's possible and logical. But here, the priest is almost too literary, in a way that he turns an elegant phrase that Hugo himself might, might have turned out in narrative, and that somewhat takes away from the reality of a man talking desperately and passionately and in a chaotic state. Uh, there is a certain kind of literary elegance, uh, which I will identify as a wider principle, a certain kind of tendency to narrate, even though beautifully, rather than stick to, to showing only by the means of the scene at hand. In that sense, Hugo's epistemology, or view of human epistemology, is somewhat less, less rationally realistic than mine. It is not fully as strictly rational in our sense of the word. That is, he is not as concerned with the fact are very creating reality as exactly as one can do it in words for you to perceive it and then uh, to get a slanted, a selective image in your mind. He interferes uh, with his own presentation very often, in the, interferes in the sense which I said I don't, that is the author is apparent. Uh, and in narration uh, passages, it would, in his writing, it would be much more apparent than in dialogue passages. That he permits himself to editorialize almost to the point of it's Hugo speaking. Uh, 
And he incidentally comes across as the most fascinating kind of speaker. That is, the writing is brilliant, elegant, he always has something very powerful to say. But it is non-objective only in that sense that he permits the uh, presence of the author as a narrator in his manner of stating things. Whereas I, I would never do that. That is one difference. Uh, the other difference, and that has to do with certain kind of repetition, which is beyond uh, the necessity of the chaos and confusion that we discussed. The chaos repetition is, of course, very effective, but he does more than that, and, and this incidentally is a abridged version of what goes on for 10 pages. But the real issue there is this. Uh, now observe, we have this much in common, uh, that we deal in concrete, and that we deal in essence. That there are no irrelevant details, even though he repeats himself, observes that any kind of concrete that he gives you is one that underscores the essence of what he feels, and never any small irrelevant details. So in that sense, it's the same principle of writing. Which of the two manners of writing would you say is the more intellectual? Yes. That, I think, is the uh, most crucial difference. I didn't give you a long enough passage of mine on the premise that you know Atlas and the Thompson so well that you can remember other passages uh, that will show, in effect, again, this long passage. Uh, the fact that I don't repeat myself except intentionally is the tighter rational discipline. Hugo writes much more emotionally and inspirationally. And by that, I don't mean the issue of whether he rewrites or edits himself. That, that would be relevant by what means it's achieved. But the fact is that his approach to, to style, his way of, of selecting, uh, consists of projecting above all the emotion involved. Now, it, uh, as a, a philosophical romanticist of the first order, he would know that you don't project emotions, qua emotions, as you will see in the next selection. Uh, he doesn't know that they come from concrete, uh, they come from certain premises, and that is what he projects. But he's much less concerned with the intellectual meaning of the emotions projected and with the intellectual method of projecting them. Of the two styles, I was startled to see when I read them together, mine is much more masculine. If by masculine we mean a kind of a tight economy of intellectual content, where even if I write about violent emotion, I weigh every word for its direct meaning, for its connotation, for what it will add to the sentence. It's a much more controlled uh, idea of presentation, whereas the rest you go is much freer. I'm not saying now which is better or worse. I'm only identifying an essential difference there. Yes? I was confused on one point. You say that you the way of your work and the length of your point, but in context of that, there's a tight economy. Before you said that you want to write from one's premises, as you found it in. You mean, are you talking now about a second or third revision? Oh, th thank you very much for calling that to my attention, that kind of, of confusion I don't want to leave in your mind. Uh, no, I would say, I'll tell you exactly how this was written, for instance, uh, that second paragraph of the quotation. It was written inspirationally. It was written, as, as I advise you, it is right as you feel when you come to it, then edit. But then when I edit, I would stop and consider every word. Is this an extraneous word or is it necessary? Why do I want to keep it in? In the case of this particular passage, it stayed in practically as first written. I went over it perhaps ten times at different times just to consider it consciously and very few changes were made. But now, the reason I could write it that way is because my, my premises were set to that kind of expression so that my subconscious would not throw me very many extraneous things. However, there were other uh, passages in the book where my subconscious didn't function so well. 
And then it would mean ten times of rewriting. Then it would mean weighing every word and it's extraneous and I have to take it out. I feel that the rhythm is wrong or that some kind of word was needed here to amend what preceded but not the one I had and then it would be just doing this, sitting over it and I'll show you sometime my manuscript pages. I would never even uh, have one copied until I had made so many corrections on it that I can't even use that sheet of paper anymore. I wouldn't even copy it longhand so long as there's a space left on it. To, to, because sometimes I would experiment with ten different ways of saying a sentence right on the same piece of paper. Now that is where my subconscious would not function too well. But even at that, the reason why I would experiment that way is that I won't compose it word for word. Because by superstructure effort, it's not possible. All I can do is try and write it, then wait. Then ask yourself, sounds right, why is it right? If I can give the answer, it stays. If it's not quite right, why isn't? If I can grasp why it isn't, then, uh, then I rewrite it on a new premise. Sometimes I can't quite grasp why it's not right, but it's in a very complex issue. But it just doesn't sound right. And then you, uh, I just start trying in a different way until I suddenly see uh, this is what was missing and was needed. It's not always easy. But uh, the point is that you train your subconscious to be as economical and as purposeful as possible, and then you help it by editing, by consciously weighing the result of the treatment. It is clear. Now, you see, Hugo would not necessarily have to do it because obvious through all of his writing is the premise that uh, he does not regard writing that way. He does not regard necessarily that you have to work for a kind of philosophical or epistemological precision. Uh, it, I think in painting it would almost be as if his strokes are much wider and more impressionistic. Impressionistic, uh, maybe in the colloquial sense of the word, not the exact school of art. Uh, you know what I mean by that, kind of wider strokes, where mine would be wide, but at the same time, I would be working, it's only a metaphor, that if anyone wanted to approach my brush strokes with a microscope, they'll see that every strand there was purposefully put there. Hugo would not look at it quite so minutely. And that's... Uh, Offhand, I would not undertake to tell you uh, which method is better. I would say this, that it's a metaphysical issue. In the context of his philosophy, of his kind of idea, remembering that he is, in fact, superstructure-wise, on the Christian altruist code of values, and sub-basement-wise, not at all on it. I think that would be one of the reasons why he would not look for extreme rational precision. That would not be part of his view of life and therefore not of writing. But then granting him his values and his premises, his method was right for his philosophy and my method was right for mine, which I think is one of the examples of where one's general view of life and therefore one's code of values will show in one's writing. Now, let's come to the details of this. Sure. I noticed in reading you go that every once in a while there's a word or a phrase that is emotionally jarring with the rest of what he's trying to communicate. And I never could tell whether it's translation, merely the fact that it's archaic in the sense of, you know, from another century, or is that some premise? And there's a good example here at the end of the second paragraph. I return to myself more charm. Charm in conjunction with desperate, bewitched, and lost, and in that whole context. Just doesn't fit at all the word. That then it is an issue of language. Now that is not uh, actually what the author said, but neither is it charmed in the colloquial American way. Yeah, no, they, 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 or colloquially, I mean, in modern parlance, it, it, it acquires almost the same sense as charm to meet you, you know. But uh, in literary context, that word in French is not sharp word yet. But the original meaning and the power of being charmed in the sense of spellbound or bewitched.
Pardon? So that would not then in general indicate any uh, premise of that kind of No. No. And for instance, the strange t translation tricks. For instance, the last uh, one here. Now, it says more lost. Uh, that is the exact word in French, but it has a connotation much more to the damnation of a soul than the English word lost. What and I think perdu is the word. Perdu. But uh, in one translation of the two I just looked at today, it said nearer to perdition, and in the other one it said something like. Uh, uh, I don't remember the exact word, but more uh, corrupted or uh, nearer to corruption or something like that, uh, nearer to damnation, so, uh, something on that order. And you see the exact meaning of the word in French was exactly that of a lost soul, which it doesn't quite have in English. Uh, that you have to just allow for the translation. Whenever, if your dissatisfaction with your style rests, on the choice of a word rather than a thought, don't judge him by that. Because some words, even when translated literally, do not have the same contextual connotation. It you can't judge it by a word. So many times that I began to wonder if it was, if there was a principle, but I guess there is a principle of the translation. Well, there's also this principle that some words which are, have become archaic or too common, colloquially, in English, are not so in French. And that in the context, uh, they have a power which there would be no equivalent uh, for in another language. So never judge this, another a foreign writer stylistically by a word. What you can judge him on is by a thought. In other words, the, the first part of what I call style, the selection of the concrete that he wants to include in a sentence. That you can judge him by, but the, the literal choice of words in style one can only judge very approximately by the translation. Uh, because A, even with a sub-translator, there are things that you cannot convey fully from one language to the other. That is, if you attempted, for instance, if I attempted to give a more exact meaning to the more lost, I would have destroyed the symmetry of the whole sentence and given more emphasis than he intended to this last point. So they had to choose the lesser of two evils. Now, uh, let's go to the details of this passage. And here I want you to observe the uh, thing that we started with, uh, the definition. Uh, uh, now we'll be discussing Hugo himself, and never mind the, the difference uh, or similarities to me. Now we started by defining that the assignment of the author here is to present an intense conflict and an inst intense passion. Also, the is that it's as if he is not damning the priest, actually. Mm -hmm. But what I want you now to keep in mind is that we're not criticizing the fact of a mind and body that got to mean he goes philosophy or in the Christian morality. That is irrelevant. That we have to take as a given. This is the premise from which he writes. What is important literarily is to see by what means that premise is communicated what part is communicated intentionally, what comes across even unintentionally. And the first important point is the fact that although by the nature of the scene the priest is supposed to be confessing something terrible, the way he speaks of that love is so romantic, the examples he selects are so glowing and beautiful that you are necessarily in sympathy with him. So is the author. Incidentally, in the full context, not only of that passage, but of the novel, he tries very many times uh, to make that priest a villain somehow. And although he does terrible things in the plot, you are never convinced to the last that he's, not, that he's a villain. Pre uh, or at least not a total villain. You always feel that he's a victim of a horrible philosophy which I think was partly Hugo's intention, too. Uh, that part, I think, is intentional, that he was trying uh, to show that it's an impossible conflict. He didn't go so far as to be anti-religious, but he almost projected that, at least in this case. Now, then, the first important thing uh, is that if 
an author here really intended to ban the priest, if, if he goes full conviction, was the same as the priest. That is, that he considered this kind of passion for a priest evil, then the whole way of speaking of the passion would have been much less attractive. Then there would have been presented something ugly or cruel or sadistic or unromantic, something that would project a perverted or evil feeling. But here the feeling is so tremendously romantic that, that you feel who the hell cares about religion. Yeah. At least that is the impression I have. Uh, and even assuming a religious reader, by the way of presentation, do you feel that religion is being defended here? <laughs> no. Alan? In fact, it says that science reigns so hollow. What is in fact implied by this is that uh, uh, science or religion in this context uh, just doesn't make any sense. Uh, well, that is a more philosophical question because in that context he actually means the mind, you know. That is a sense in which this is the conflict of the mind versus the emotion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it isn't just that. Well, I'm it's just a sense of knowing, doesn't it? Yeah, I am a conception yeah. of science as being a philosophical system of religion and, quote, science. Yes, the that's true. The proof is that the, the that, example of science which he gives is the author, the work, and... And, and, and his prayer books yeah. and all that, yes. Yeah, there is that implication too. No, but first just a presentation of the nature of the love. You see, in the whole of this passage, and that's true of the scene as a whole, there are no exalted examples or sentences in defense of his religion. If Hugo's own viewpoint had been what is ostensibly supposed to be in the novel, that is, he condemns the priest. Uh, not that he exalts religion, but that he considers the priest a villain for, for this kind of conflict. Uh, nevertheless, if he wanted to present with full uh, impartiality the balance between the two, he would have had to present the passion less attractively and religion a little, a little more forcefully. But in the whole of this passage, observe that when he mentions religion, it's only in a sacrilegious and blasphemous manner. He doesn't even indicate, I think only once at the beginning of the scene, how much religion meant to him. In this particular projection, religion means nothing. He wants to put God under her feet, which is wonderful. But that is not the way to project a guilty passion. And I think it's... Uh, uh, that is, I'm calling your attention to the issue of selection of content. You see, that he selects these kind of statements for the priest to make is what achieves the effect which we named. That it's a conflict, all right, but that the author himself does not think that the priest is evil. In the course of the novel and of the kind of things that the priest does, it is obvious that Hugo did intend him as a villain. Uh, but psychologically and philosophically, he was, he, Hugo, was not sold on it. And of course, that conflict will show in style and pre by precisely this kind of means. Uh, incidentally, uh, I'll tell you what explanation he gives for the psychology of his priest in one later passage, which is totally inadequate. He, in fact, has the priest think that love, which is such a great value for everybody and which makes men good and happy, etc., when it occurs in a priest, makes him a demon. Now, uh, that is a very nice literary sentence, but psychologically it says and means literally nothing. Because the point that Hugo leaves alone and is unable, actually, to resolve uh, is, well, why does love make him a demon? Yet, by the nature of Hugo's treatment of the whole issue, his, Hugo's sub-basement is so much on the side of love and of this earth 
that uh, I would say may his God help him because he was a deist. As far as I know, he believed in God and it's, uh, God is all over his novel. But it's literally a God that reads and sounds like a literary metaphor. That it, to him, it's a grand conception. It is not really mysticism. And that, again, is an issue of a conflict between his conscious convictions and his deepest view of life or sense of life, or what we call his sub uh, in You can see it all over his literary style. And right in the example of this passage, would you say that this is a man who is anti-Earth? No. Now, I want to remind you of those of you who were at the meeting at NYU at the book club. Do you remember there was a young man who started arguing with me about this novel? And he said that why well, it was a deterministic novel. They were all victims of fate and then later he said of history. Well, why he said of history, I don't know, except that it sounded vaguely that he had read some Marxist textbook on literature because they always uh, explain literary development by history. Everything. All everything, yeah. But literature in particular, because they go so far as to say that Schiller's dramas represented the revived trade with the Orient. And yeah, well, like that, yes. I mean, they go into ludicrous okay. city of the, you know, the journalistic headlines of that moment of that century. Uh, but now what's interesting to observe here is the first part of that young man's statement that he said, well, this is a determinist novel because the priest himself uh, believes that it's all fake, which is true. That was what the priest believes. But the important thing uh, to observe is whether Hugo himself believed it or not. And he didn't by the rest of his novels. Let us assume that he decided to believe it in this story, that that was his premise. What's interesting is the way in which a romantic approach to literature would not permit a man to write on the determinist premise, even if he set himself that premise. Uh, the priest goes through his whole novel uh, announcing that it's fake. In, in fact, earlier in this speech, he states to the girl that he lost the battle against temptation because it's God's fault. God did not give to man a power as strong as the devil's. So he couldn't resist the devil. Now that is a determinist premise. states to the girl that he lost the battle against temptation because it's God's fault. God did not give to man a power as strong as the devil's. So he couldn't resist the devil. Now that is a determinist premise. Now what an author might have his characters tell, or even what he himself might try to say, as he stated philosophy in, in, in any work, is a totally different issue from what are his actual emotional premises, that which we call his abatement or his sense of life. No romantic novelist can write a determinist character. And right in this speech, you can see the illustration of it. While he is uh, constantly interrupting himself with folly, despair, and futility, and that kind of exclamation, <laughs> what comes across is a violent sense of choice of values. Not necessarily in specific statements. It isn't only that he says, I wanted to see you again, then I search for you, etc. It's not as crude as that. It's in the whole approach of a man expressing a violence of emotion which can come only from the possibility of choice. An automaton does not experience violent emotion. And as we discussed before, if you remember, we mentioned that uh, on the determinist premise, emotions of pain are all the negatives are very convincingly portrayed. Emotions of this kind of violent passion for a specific object on earth could never have place, even in a tragic conflict, never take place in a naturalistic approach. And therefore what I wanted you to keep very clear and what I could not have explained at the meeting because that would have uh, necessitated a whole philosophical literary discussion 
is that when I speak of the naturalist versus the romantic school, it has nothing to do with the avowed philosophies of the writers involved. It is quite possible for a writer to believe in free will in some kind of undefined, floating, abstraction way, and yet, sub-basement-wise, be a determinist, and therefore his writing will be naturalistic, even if he might preach moral reform or all kind of free will Steinbeck. issues. Huh? Steinbeck. Steinbeck, in a way, yes. Well, in that sense, Lewis, too, there's a whole school of the social reform novelist, Zola. I mean, there are people who, as their premise is that man has no free will, but society has. Somehow, social conditions can be changed, and we can advocate reforms to fight certain evil conditions like poverty or ignorance or whatever thereafter. But they can have a social value viewpoint. But that is really just a superstructure uh, contradiction. It has nothing to do with fundamental metaphysics from which an author's style and method of writing comes. Yes? Uh, could a determinist present a violent conflict in a character? Because I would think not for this reason that the essence of a conflict is that there's two violent forces clashing against him, pulling him in opposite directions. In effect, and that he has, in this particular scene, for example, he is very violently exerting an act of will. In fact, not to act on his emotion and to remember that he is in control. In that sense, it is the, in, the whole scene is a demonstration of the power of the human will in the face of those imposed conditioning or uh, irresistible. Force. Well, not quite, because the nature of the scene is he has broken down. In fact, what he tells is he can't resist his passion any longer. But he's still resisting it in the act of saying it. Oh, yes. Uh, now, as to whether... It was a real determinist, what did you say, well, I feel that safe to go up? Now, wait, remember this, that that is a mistake that we must make. No determinist can be a con consistent determinist, particularly not if he's a writer. No matter how naturalistic <coughs> his method of approach, if he were a true determinist, there would be no sense in recording anything because it would not be applicable to the next person. That is, if you uh, read about what happened to Anna Karenina, there is no way at all for you to learn anything from it or to decide whether it will or will not happen to you or what to do about it. Uh, and even if you take statistical archetypes and say, well, this is what happened to a whole class of people, that doesn't mean anything for the next class of people. Uh, so that you cannot be a consistent determinist. Uh, what you will observe is the inroad of romanticism, meaning of the free will premise, on all the determinists are tremendous. Uh, and so that what we can, uh, when we speak of dividing them into school, never expect full consistency on the irrational premise. And the same applies to schools of philosophy. It is only the extent to which any school of thought approaches rationality that you can observe consistency. When it is a wrong premise, inconsistencies will necessarily occur. Well, and the, uh, uh, to answer your question, do naturalists present violent conflicts? I don't know quite how to answer it because how would you classify Shakespeare? I already discussed that he's not a real naturalist. And in fact, what he presents are not really conflicts. No, what he presents is men in the grip of some terrible passion. Yeah. And they're just declaiming or acting on the fact that, well, I can't resist my jealousy or I can't resist my parental uh, ambition or whichever the uh, evils are. It is never a man fighting between two possibilities exactly. Now you could say Hamlet uh, fights against to be or not to be, to act or to be passive. It's not a violent conflict. What if someone to goes... <clears throat> uh, he doesn't do anything about it. Well, he yeah. Uh, and, in, and it's to that extent that it's not uh, moon in so many ways is not a full determinist. And yet, philosophically, he is. Consciously, he is. And in the literary style, he's certainly a naturalist, much more than a romantic. But the romantic elements, particularly now, take his short stories, are very often breaking through. 
So that's a conflict of their problem, not mine, in effect. Point out what specific things give you the very overpowering sense that this man is in control, even in spite of everything, and that he's confessing and he's lost the battle? Uh, what specific kind of line give you that sense? Well, first of all, the, 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 the total of the story, but if you want to take just this particular right, passage. Just on this, I haven't read the rest of it. Right. Well, uh, on the question of determinism, yeah. uh, the whole his whole approach to it. Uh, for instance, the fact that he comes and says what he tried to do, how he tried to fight it, then if he didn't succeed, he went to see her again, and when he felt the desire to see her again, why then he waited for her, and he watched for her, and he's constantly talking about what he is doing, and he's constantly begging her to uh, have some pity on him, by which he means to consent to love him. He is taking action yeah. on, on his yeah. uh, conflict. That is, he decided he can't fight it any longer. Well, now he's going to try and win her. Yeah. But he is acting on it, and the whole violence is intended for what purpose? I can convince her that my love is so great that maybe I will win her. That is a man in charge of his own destiny. Even if he says, I can't help that. God made me weaker than the devil. I'm now carrying out the order of the devil. But it's I who am carrying it out. I'm not waiting for the devil to bring the girl to me. Yes. Now I have to do something. And that is through the whole uh, speech, the whole setup, and everything about the man. Yes? Very specifically, he uses I to reveal and never with a passive verb. That's, that's awesome. He never, yes. You know, I am moved. <laughs> I am, uh... He never says I was carried away, yeah, or I found away. myself doing this or that. I hope, I wait, I, I seek... Uh, That's right. Yes, yeah, tremendous self-assertion. Observe that. And <laughs> no sense that now there's another aspect of it. In a naturalist novel, if a man with a passion he can't resist, there's a tremendous tone of whining. There will be a tone of complaint about the, uh, amounting to, in style, I couldn't help it, look at poor little me. Now here he says, have pity on me, mercy, all the begging terms, and that is not the tone that comes across. See, that's why you have to watch the context. And now, uh, we were to discuss the concrete by which he communicates his point. Well, now observe, for instance, uh, he starts by saying that he used all my remedies. If he had said, I tried to fight it, that would be a, a floating abstraction or, or a generalization. But he gives you the particular kind of remedies that he tried. That's one type of concretization. Uh, then, a very good and very typically romantic touch is when he asks her, do you know what I always uh, soul dance was between the book and, and me, your shadow, the luminous apparition, etc. Now, if he had said that I kept constantly seeing your picture in my mind, that is not as strong or as convincing as between himself and his prayer book. You can literally see almost the, the girl dancing across the prayer book. That is what makes it extremely colorful and at the same time convincing because it's specific. In other words, you know that when he tried to concentrate on his science or his work, he was seeing the image of the girl. That gives you the sense of how that emotion was experienced by him, not a generalized narration of, I constantly sought of you and nothing helped. Uh, look at the next uh, paragraph. The, hearing her song uh, and, and her feet dancing on the prayer book, again, that those are concretizations, conveying the exact sort of thing that he experienced. And that next sentence uh, about feeling your shape sleeping against my flesh, which was omitted in one of the translations, uh, where they put exactly the kind of stylistic thing which Hugo would not do, seeing you in my dreams, which is a bad, meaningless, bromidic generalization, whereas here he makes it very concrete the kind of very dramatic simplicity and again concretization with which he says 
is all his lengthy reasons why he wanted to see her again. I saw you, I saw you again. The brief sentences which have tremendous impact in view of the context. Uh, and then he goes into the consequences. And again, he makes them concrete. He doesn't say, well, from then on, uh, I was helplessly committed to my passion. No, he tells you just what he did. And he gives you even such details as I watched you from the top of my tower. And that is the reminder. Okay. Hugo never let you forget the full context. And in preceding this scene, a, a, a great deal has been said and established about the nature of the, the cathedral of Notre Dame and the towers and the collection practically takes place there. Once he reminds you of I watched you from the top of my tower, it's a Marvel's concretization that, again, evokes the whole context in the reader's mind. You would know concretely, you kind of see in the brief sentence, the picture of him standing on that tower and the girl dancing in, in the square below. Uh, that is a very good touch of concretization. Uh, the, and the last sentence, incidentally, as we discussed in French, is much more specifically tragic. Because uh, in English you couldn't quite get the exact words. Uh, now look at the next paragraph. What it gives you the complete to love a woman, to be a priest, to be hit. Uh, which is very strong, concrete, named very dramatically, naming the exact essence of his conflict, and very specifically. Look at her next. Everything that he would give for her smile. Again, the method of giving the complete. The bad writing would have been, I'd give anything for one, for your favor. And that would be a, a meaningless sorting abstraction. And then, the very dramatic touch, and to see her enamored of a soldier's uniform. He doesn't even say of a soldier. I mean, the rival with whom she is in love is a terrible kind of brainless dog. Uh, but he's very resplendent always, he's a captain in the army. And it's very eloquent, you see, again, a dramatic use of concrete, not abstraction. He didn't say enamored of a stupid soldier, which would have been a much weaker way of presenting the same thing. He makes it much more concrete. In fact, he says she's enamored of an empty uniform. The next sentence, she again he concretized. We have nothing to offer her but a squalid Catholic or a priest. Now, that, he doesn't mean that literally, but by means of a concrete, that is, by contrasting his garment with the garment of a soldier, he's projecting the whole difference of the two lives. Uh, the austere, unromantic life of a priest versus the, the soldier who would be much more of the source and of glamour, at least in her eyes. And that is a very skillful use of a tiny, specific concrete that names the whole essence of the situation. Now, observe the next sentence. You see all the use of concrete. If he had said, I was tortured by the thought of you night and day, that wouldn't do what, uh, what he does here. But he gives you the particulars of the way in which that torture would be established, I mean, uh, experienced. But they are the essential, the startling, the strong particulars. And a very the good touch is your teeth that bite your hand. Observe that all the others are metaphors. Uh, because arteries don't literally boil, and the heart doesn't break in his head, isn't splitting, literally. Uh, those are just metaphors or, or, or exaggeration. But he built it up to the line, your uh, teeth biting your hand, that is concrete. I mean, you have the feeling that that he really did, and it conveys the nature of the agony very, very dramatically and convincingly. Now look at the last line. Torture with one hand, but caress me with the other. Now that kind of names the whole issue of his conflict. It's an irrational thing to say, uh, but that is a very dramatic. The, the exact irrationality of the impossible, which he's asking of her and the predicament in which he sees himself. 
Oh, Zos. I'm the essential subject. I'll keep those At this point, a comment was made concerning Miss Rand's choice of scene from Atlas with which to compare this speech. She was asked if the morning after speech that Reardon makes to Dagny wouldn't have been a better comparison. And why didn't she choose it? Uh, but do you know what, why I did it? Yeah. And it sort of occurred to me. Do you know why not? Because it's not conscious. Huh? It's not conscious. He's not conscious that he loves it. Oh, no. Because it, my assignment uh, in selecting this was to show an author's essential approach to love. Uh, Reardon's approach is not essentially mine. Now, you, you can infer, by the way that speech is written, just what you can infer here, is that only I'm more blatantly than you go not on Reardon's side. Uh, but then it's a subtle and indirect issue. Uh, to present my approach to love, this was my approach to love. Now, as to the Reardon speech, I wonder how many of you are realized you don't even in regard to Reardon's speech. Now, I had read this novel originally between the ages of 14 and 16, somewhere. I had looked at it once in Hollywood after the reading scene was written. I had not thought of this speech in relation to reading speech until I was translating it. And yet the influence is tremendous. Uh, it's tremendous, it's directly, if it goes influence. But do you see in what sense I was not copying him? There is no single sentence that you would say was taking his concretes. But the essence of the drama was there. And Darren asked me as a question, now, wouldn't I have thought of the written speech even without ever reading this book? Possibly. But that is not the point. The point is that I was very aware at the time I read this in my teens, that this is tremendously important thing that I liked, that the conflict of a man torn between a love which in fact is proper because of wrong premises, which is how I interpreted him from even at that age. Uh, the drama of that remained with me as a very strong impression. Therefore, by the time I needed a scene like Reardon that me, that value literarily was already in my mind. I would be attracted emotionally, literarily, to that kind of scene. You see, that's the way an influence works. And incidentally, if you're interested, working on this suddenly made me realize what I'm doing to all of you. And uh, literally, I'm delighted with it. Because when I realized what Hugo's influence did to me, how much to the good it was, if my writing inspires you in the same way, it's the most invaluable thing I can do for any of you, but I'm not an altruist, I'm not boasting of it in that way. It's just that I am glad suddenly see over the years what a rational value can do to other rational minds. And in that sense, God bless you. But you call God, you know, the, the metaphorical God. Uh, this is totally as an aside. When I worked on all these selections yesterday, I had them all selected except I had not made a translation. And, until, and I looked up Hugo last because I knew that would have to be translated. I was so depressed by the whole collection of them and by the fact that uh, really philosophically there isn't one writer in the whole collection I approve of except myself. Uh, well, Mickey Spillane is uh, really kind of our lower great brother, so that that's not exactly a philosophical ally. And I was really disheartened by the whole spectacle. I didn't like the idea of here I am as the only good writer to offer in a literary class. Then I read this, and it was as if my whole universe cracked me. I spent all night till six in the morning reading Notre Dame for pleasure. I attacked the whole second volume, skipping the aside. For the sheer literary pleasure of feeling, you know, on the standard premise, when he was good in the moment, how wonderful to see a great achievement which isn't mine. But I mean, this is what's totally missing from literature today. There isn't anybody today that one could find with this kind of grand scale sense of life and men. Uh, do you see from just this comparison what kind of view of men comes across from, from all those literary selections? 
And that's what's missing, and that's what I hope those of you who will be writers, please carry on, because without it, really, the whole world will perish. <laughs>